Hey everyone, and welcome to week four of Computer Science 225. This week we're talking about, I think, my favorite program ever, which is the Vim Text Editor. Vim, as a text editor, is a program that's going to let us actually put things into files. So, so far, we've talked about files, but we haven't looked at how do you actually create files and put things inside of them, or take files that exist and make changes to them, which of course, as you're doing software development is a thing that we're going to have to do all the time. Pretty much all coding involves editing text files. So Vim is a program that allows us to do that. And like Unix itself, it has a really long history. The first version of Vim or VI uh, was developed in 1976 by Bill Joy, and it was called VI as standing for visual because it was a visual editor. It let you actually see the file as you were making changes to it, which is pretty obvious, but in 1976 uh, that separated it from some other file editors like the ED program, just ED. Um, VI was developed over a long period of time, and then a newer version of it was created in 1991 by uh, Bram Moulnier, uh, which was called Vim for VI Improved. And Vim is the one that we're going to look at and study in this class. I will sometimes just call it VI. Um, that's just uh, sort of out of habit. The two um, programs, while being slightly technically different, are uh, used you know, to refer to the, to the same essential program. Um, and so I'll call it VI or Vim sort of uh, interchangeably. So. The benefit of learning how to use this program Vim is that it lets you edit files directly on command line systems. So if you need it to log into a web server and make a change to a file, there's broadly two different ways that you can do that. One would be to transfer the file from the web server onto your own local computer, then open up a GUI uh, text editor like Visual Studio Code or Sublime Text or something like that and then make the change there, or just Notepad or WordPad, I guess, then transfer the file back onto the web server using FileZilla, which we talked about last week, or something like that. Then the other way of doing it is to directly within the command line, just open up the file in a command line editor and make the change and save it. And that turns out to be a lot more convenient. As we're working on um, things across the command line, it's really nice to be able to just work directly on the command line and edit files right, you know, using commands uh, and not having to transfer files back and forth. It's a lot more convenient. So that's one great big benefit of Vim over the editors that you're used to using, which are GUI things, like I said, Visual Studio Code or WordPad or IntelliJ or whatever else it is. Um, Vim, because it's running directly on the server, there's no transferring of files required. You can just do it directly. The other big uh, well, one of the other big benefits of Vim is that it's installed on pretty much every command line system. Uh, you, If you're logging into a system for the first time, maybe it's a uh, research computer that you need to log on to, uh, a supercomputer or a web server, or maybe you're logging into um, a little uh, uh, embedded system. Uh, like I said, that's done over the command line as well. Um, chances are Vim is already there, and you can just fire it up and start editing files right away. There's no real setup or installation. Usually that has to happen. Um, the other and biggest benefit of Vim is that it's actually a really well-designed program. It's not something that I and others who use Vim just use because it happens to be there or because it lets you do it right on the command line. It's uh, a lot more efficient and convenient than GUI programs tend to be. Um, there's a few reasons for this. One, I think, is because it was developed over such a long period of time that has really been refined and developed, and um, any problems that existed in it have been solved, I think. Another is that because it's uh, designed primarily to be used with command, command line systems, there's no uh, reason to ever use a mouse. As we've seen, you don't use a mouse in the command line system. It's all keyboard driven. And because of that, it's very efficient. You don't have to ever, like, hunt and peck with the mouse through like a view menu or anything like that to make things happen. Instead, it's all keyboard oriented, which is a lot more efficient. You don't have to take your hands off the keyboard to do stuff. Instead, you can just use key commands. Um, once you learn this program, it is really, really efficient. Uh, it uh, lets you work more quickly and without having to uh, as I said, take your hands off the keyboard. I use Vim not just to write code, uh, pretty much all code I've written over the past 
10 plus years, 15 plus years has been in Vim. Um, I also use it to write papers, to um, write the notes for my website, to write letters, uh, to write a book. Uh, I use it for everything. Once you get used to the system and the way it works, it is uh, incredibly effective at, at editing text. So this week we're going to focus on sort of the basics of using Vim on the command line. How do we open up a file and make changes to it? Things like that. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, cutting and copying and pasting, undo and redo, saving files, sort of the basic things that you need to be as effective as you are with Visual Studio Code or IntelliJ or Notepad or whatever else it is that you are used to using for your coding and file editing. Later on in the semester, in I think it is week 13, we'll take a look at some of the more advanced things that Vim has that other editing systems don't have. But for now, let's get started by pulling up a terminal. And we can, I guess, first log in to the CPSC server so that we can start using Vim. So I'll just SSH in real quick. Um, so using Vim is done with the Vim command. So you can type Vim and hit Enter. And this command is going to work a bit different than the other commands we've learned so far. So far, the other commands have done some action and maybe printed us some output, like maybe printed out uh, listings for our files, or maybe printed out a file with the cat command, stuff like that. Um, and then they give us back the prompt immediately so that we can type another command. The Vim program isn't like this. It's an interactive program. And so when we type the Vim command, it is going to take over the terminal and we're not going to see our prompt. Instead, we're going to be inside the Vim command. So when I hit Enter here, now I'm inside this program called Vim. And by default, if you open it just by typing Vim, it will give you this sort of uh, boilerplate text about uh, what version it is. And uh, like uh, I said, the main, the main developer, Bram uh, Mulinar, I'm not totally sure how you say his last name, actually. Um, and it gives you some other stuff on how to quit and how to uh, get help and stuff like that. So if you just open it like this, you can um, begin creating a new file. So before we um, talk about that, let's talk about how to quit Vim. It's sort of a running meme in programming that uh, if you open Vim and you've never used it before, that you won't know how to exit and you won't know how to quit out. If you open it without a file, it actually tells you how to quit out. So if you type colon Q, you can quit out. And now we'll be back on the command line. And as you can see, this program Vim uh, like I said before, it runs interactively. It doesn't uh, run in a one-shot one thing like the other commands we've learned so far. Instead, it runs for a while, and then only when you quit it are you brought back here to the command line. So that's one way to use Vim. The other sort of more common way to use Vim is to give it the name of a file that already exists, or the name of a new file. So here I have this program.py. I can open that with Vim by typing the command Vim followed by the name of the file I want to open, vim program.py. Now when you open this file up, it will give you that file sort of open up so that you can make changes to it. This is the primary way you use vim, is to open a file that already exists so that you can make changes. Um, as you can see, it displays the file out to you, um, and it has uh, some things that are common in other text editors, like it has syntax highlighting because this is a Python file. It comments the comment in green, and it has like the strings in teal and built-in things like print and input in blue and stuff like that it has basic syntax highlighting that other text editors have. Now we can quit out of this by typing colon Q again, because there's actually something we have to talk about before we talk about making changes to this. For instance, if I wanted to just type uh, another line onto this file, like maybe I will print like a message that says goodbye. If I just start typing P-R-I-N-T, oh, actually that was crazy. Uh, you can see that things didn't happen. It didn't actually put in the word print. Instead, it pasted something in and then it said pattern not found new. And that's because Vim works very differently from other text editors. And we need to talk about how that works. So let's pull over um, a tablet real quick and we can talk about the Vim mode system. OK, so Vim, unlike other common text editors that you're probably used to using, 
is what's called modal, in that it has different modes of operation. And depending on what mode you're in, the key commands that you'll give it are very different. There's uh, a few different command, uh, a few different modes rather. The mode that you start off in is called command mode. In command mode, you don't actually enter text. You instead do commands to change the text. We'll talk about what some of those are um, in a sec here. But the other mode, uh, one of the other modes I should say that you will spend time in is insert mode. When you're in insert mode, you actually can type text and it will go into the file that you're editing. This is a common sort of thing that is maybe hard to get used to for new people using Vim, is that in uh, normal, not normal, but non-Vim uh, text editors like uh, IntelliJ or WordPad or whatever, all of those work in the same basic way in which that you're pretty much always in what Vim would consider insert mode. Whenever you are in the file, if you type stuff, it goes into the file. That's not how Vim works. <laughs> in Vim, you have to be in insert mode to insert text. And when you're not in insert mode, if you're in command mode, then your keys do different things. The great benefit of this is that you can have simpler key commands uh, than you can in other text editors. In a normal text editor, if you type P, for instance, it will um, put in the word P, or the letter P, rather, into the file you're editing. And if you want to um, put a P into a file in Vim, you have to be in insert mode. If you do Vim, uh, P in insert mode, it'll put a P into your file. In Vim, if you're in command mode and you do P, it does paste. That is nice because P is a nice, easy to type uh, command. In a sort of GUI um, text editor to paste, you have to do control V which we're all sort of used to because that's how you've used text editors for a long time now. But if you think about it, that kind of actually is not great. First of all, what does the V even stand for? I don't think anyone uh, of you probably know. I don't know myself. Um, but also you have to reach over and do the control probably with your pinky and then the V with your index finger, which is uh, sort of a strain on your fingers eventually if you do it that many times. And also it's kind of hard to remember um, this is such a common command that you all probably remember it. But P, I think, is a universally better uh, command for doing paste than Control V. And so that's the reason Vim has this mode system. It lets you sort of uh, have better commands, better uh, shortcuts, because you can just use regular old letters for them. You don't have to do controls and alts and shifts and all that kind of junk. So that's the main reason for this. So we have to go back and forth between these two modes. We go into insert mode when we want to enter text, and then we go back into command mode when we want to do stuff to the text, like undo and redo, copy and paste, save, quit, those kinds of things. So how do you get between one, uh, one mode and another? Well, to go from command to insert mode, you can do one of two things. You can either do I to get in there, the I key, or if you're using a keyboard that has an insert key, you can just hit the insert key. So either I or insert brings you from command mode into insert mode. Then if you want to go back from insert mode into command mode, you use the escape key. So let's see how this works when we um, actually fire up Vim again. So I'm going to open up program.py again. And now if you notice, I'm in command mode. Command mode is the default one. That's where you start out in. So if I do things like type, I don't know, uh, P again, it does paste. Uh, it doesn't actually type a P. If I want to actually put a P into this file, I have to go into insert mode first, which like I said, I will use by, I will do by pushing the I key. Then when you do that, if you notice down here, it gives you this little visual clue that you're in insert mode. At the bottom, it has the word insert now. Now, if I type letters, they actually appear into the file. So I'm in insert mode to do my typing. Then if I want to, for instance, save this file, I will hit escape first to go back into command mode. So when you're editing in Vim, you go back and forth between insert and command mode. Now I can save, which incidentally is colon W. W standing for write, as in like write the file back to disk. And then that will save the file back out. Now again, if I type 
keys, it doesn't actually put things into the file. Instead, it does whatever that key does in command mode. There's actually a couple of other um, modes as well. Insert and command mode are the ones that you're going to use most often. There's also replace mode. And replace mode works very similarly to insert mode, except that instead of um, inserting characters into the, the document, it replaces characters that are in the document. Um, GUI text editors actually have this as well. I don't think most people use it uh, in GUI text editors, but if you hit your insert key in something like Notepad, it will go back and forth between insert and replace, and it'll let you overwrite text instead of sort of insert before it. So that's a thing that, uh, that Vim has as well. To go from command mode into replace mode, you can do capital R. So capital R takes you from command mode into replace mode. And then to get from replace mode back to command mode, it's escape, just the same as it is from insert. In fact, no matter what mode you're in, if you type the escape key, it brings you back to command mode. Luckily, um, if you're in command mode and you hit escape, it does nothing. It keeps you in command mode. So no matter what mode you're in, you can hit escape, and that will guarantee you that you're in command mode, which is a, a thing that Vim uh, users will often do. They'll sort of just hit escape just to make sure they're in command mode if you're not like totally sure for whatever reason. So let's look at what uh, replace mode does. If I'm here in this file and I am, let's say, uh, I have the cursor here at the end of goodbye, or actually on the exclamation point, and I want to um, say goodbye now, or let's say goodbye for now. If I hit insert mode, then the things that I start typing go before the exclamation point. If you are in replace mode, and if you hit the capital R, it'll give you this replace thing down here, then when you type, it will instead overwrite the text that is there. So you can see now the exclamation point and the close parenthesis got overwritten, and you have to put them back again. Um, I don't use replace mode very much, but since we're here, um, that's what we're talking about. So if you want it to, for instance, overwrite this um, little sentence here with something else, you can go into replace mode and then say, please tell me who you are or something like that. Uh, then you can use replace mode to do that. Like I said, uh, I don't typically use replace mode very much, but since we're talking about modes, I thought we'd talk about it. There's another mode, however, which is uh, very commonly used and very helpful, and that's called visual mode. We'll talk more about visual mode today, but visual mode is used for selecting text. That's something you normally would do with the mouse in a uh, GUI text editor. You would normally like select around with the mouse to choose different text. For, in, ex for example, to copy and paste a big block of text, you'd select it with the mouse. With Vim, you use visual mode. To go into visual mode, you can type the V key. Um, as we'll see, there's actually a couple of different, uh, different types of visual mode, but um, the basic one you can get in with the V key, and you get back out, uh, you probably guessed it, with the escape key back into command mode. Um, visual mode is uh, really helpful, like I said, for selecting text. If we want to come back over here to this Vim instance, if I want to select, for instance, uh, all of these two lines, you can type V to go into visual mode. And as you can see, your little indicator down here tells you you're in visual. Then as you move around, you can see that the text is getting highlighted just like it would be if we grabbed it with the mouse. You can use this to then copy all of the text and then let's say paste it Oops, uh, somewhere else, uh, da -da -da, paste and uh, rather copy and paste. So visual mode is used for selecting text and we can uh, then use the escape key to go back into command mode again to do our commands to move around the file and, and save it and so on like that. All right, now let's talk about how you move around the cursor in Vim. There's a couple ways to do this. One is to use the arrow keys. The arrow keys work in Vim, and they work actually whether you're in command mode or insert mode. So if I type I to go into insert mode, you can see I can still use the arrow keys to get around uh, and still be in insert mode. But there's actually 
depending on your perspective, better ways of getting around in Vim, which is to not do it in insert mode, but rather to do it in command mode. Then you can use um, more different keys to move around. For one, you can, instead of using the arrow keys to move up, down, left, and right, you can use the, command, the keys H, J, K, and L. The benefit of this is that it keeps your fingers on the home row. So a lot of the design of Vim is geared around uh, efficiency and also um, uh, minimum amount of movement, which becomes an issue for people who do a lot of typing. If you do a lot of typing in a um, GUI text editor, you might run into problems with like your pinkies and things like that if you have to use the control and shift keys a lot or also reach over your hand to the arrow keys. So a lot of the design of Vim is based on keeping your fingers on the home row and having minimum amount of movements to accomplish different tasks. So H means go left, J means go down, K means go up, and L means go right. And so when you type these, uh, unlike commands on the command line when we have the prompt, Vim doesn't really show what key I'm pressing, so I'm, I'm uh, highlighting it on the screen um, uh, separately. Vim doesn't normally have that sort of yellow text that is showing what key I'm typing. I'm just putting that in there so you can see what I'm doing and follow along. So H goes left, uh, J goes down, K goes up, and L goes to the right. There are other ways of getting around as well. The caret, which is shift six, brings you to the beginning of the line. The dollar sign, which is shift four, brings you to the end of the line. There are other ways of getting around the file as well. You can go word by word. So if I go back to the beginning of the line, if I type W, it brings me word by word through the file as I'm going uh, down, down, down like that. You can use the B key to go back by word, back, back, back by word, which is, um, helpful as you go. Uh, you can do um, little g, little g. That always brings you to the beginning of the file. And you can do capital G to jump to the end of the file. You can also jump to a specific line. So if I want to go to line 3, I can type 3, capital G. And that will bring me to line 3. That's not as helpful when the file is only five lines long, because I could have just done uh, the k command up to get a couple of uh, spaces up. Um, but uh, if you have you know, a file that's hundreds of lines long, you can jump to specific lines. Again, it is whatever the line number is. So I can jump to line five with five capital G like that. Notice, of course, you have to be in command mode for that to work. If I'm in insert mode and I type five capital G, obviously it's going to literally type the characters five G into the file. Um, that's why uh, you're going to spend some time in command mode so that you can do these sort of nice short commands to move around the file as you're doing stuff. There's actually tons more um, movement commands to get around to different places in the file, but we're going to save some of them for later. I don't want to overwhelm you with it. So the important ones are sort of HJKL to move around the file, caret to go to the beginning, dollar to go to the end, B and W sort of move you word by word. GG is the top of the file, just capital G is the end, and then a specific number followed by G brings you to that specific line. That's sort of enough to sort of learn as you're, as you're getting going with it. There's actually a lot more. And the benefit of these is that they can be combined up with other actions, as we'll see later in them. Um, but for now, we'll just use them to move around. Next, we'll talk about saving and quitting. So the way that you save, as I said earlier, is colon w. There's some commands in Vim that start with colons, and those will bring up this sort of command area down here at the bottom where you can see the command that you're typing out. Uh, saving is one of those, so I can do colon w, which will allow me to save the program. Quitting is done with colon q, so q will quit out. If I open the program again, I can also do, let me make just a change to this. Let's get rid of this line here. I can do colon wq to save and quit the file. And that will do the same thing effectively as doing colon w followed by colon q. You can just do colon wq to save and quit all in one go. There's another command for this. Um, like if I just make another little change to this, um, which is 
shift ZZ. So a capital Z followed by a capital Z also saves and quits. And this is the one that I use. I'm just really in the habit of doing uh, capital Z, capital Z like that to get out of the file. So there's a few different ways of doing it. Something else we should talk about when we're talking about saving is how do you specify the name of the file? So if instead of editing an existing file, like I did earlier, if I just open Vim and start typing stuff, like maybe I'll just type, hello, uh, how are you in insert mode? If I try to save now, Vim will tell me that there is no file name because I didn't open it with a file name. So Vim doesn't know what I want to save the file as. So I can do colon W and then give it the name of the file. Like maybe I'll call this note.txt. And then it will allow me to save it. And you can see that it says it's a new file here. So if you didn't specify the name of the file originally on the command line, you can do it um, like that. You can also load files if you want to. The command for that is colon E. So if I opened it without a file, I can do colon E to load up note.txt and then save it with just colon W because now it already knows what file that uh, this is called. If you are trying to leave Vim and you have unsaved changes, like maybe I'll make another um, note to this that says I am well. If I try to just quit, Vim will tell me no write since last change, which means that I have unsaved work in here. So there's two things I can do. I can either save it first with colon W or colon W quit, uh, WQ to save and quit. Or if I really, really want to not make any changes to this, I can exit with colon Q exclamation point. Exclamation point in Vim generally means like, do this thing anyway, even though otherwise you'd give me a warning. So if I colon Q exclamation point, then it will quit out of the file. But now inside of this, I've lost the extra little bit of text I put in there. Something else I should note is that uh, it would be sort of not the best to quit out of Vim by uh, hitting this X here. Uh, that would close not only Vim, but also the terminal that I'm running. Uh, PuTTY or the terminal emulator if you're using Mac or Linux. And it would also close my SSH session, and it would also close the bash shell I was running, and it would close out of Vim. And so generally, you shouldn't close out of Vim by hitting the X here. Instead, you, can, you should colon Q out and then exit the command line by typing the exit program or doing control D. If you do close out of Vim suddenly like this and you had unsaved work, um, it would create a backup file for you, so you would probably not lose the changes that you'd made. Uh, but we'll talk about how you deal with those um, uh, later on in this course. All right, so next let's talk about how we do copying, cutting, and pasting. These are really, really helpful things that you'll want to do uh, as you're coding, of course. The way Vim does this is it has a couple of different commands. There's um, X, which just cuts a single character. So if I do it with um, uh, on, this, on this N of name, if I hit X here, it will cut just the single character. And so if I keep hitting X, it sort of deletes characters as we go. Uh, more commonly, instead, you'll not cut a single character like that, but you'll cut an entire line or more. Um, and so the way that you can do that is with the dd command. dd cuts a single line. If I wanted to copy a line instead, I would use yy. So dd cuts an entire line, and yy copies an entire line. Now, Vim uses different sort of letter mnemonics than um, we use on other programs. Usually, as you know, it's control x to cut and control c to copy. Um, for most programs. But in Vim, D is cut. D stands for delete. So it deletes it, but it also makes a copy of it. So it's like the cut that you know of. Um, so D is for cut. And then Y is for copy. Y stands for yank. So when I um, do YY to copy a line, um, in Vim terms, I would be yanking that line. Then we can go down and we can paste it. Paste, as I mentioned earlier, I think, is done with the P command. All of these are done in command mode, by the way, not insert mode. In insert mode, you're not doing copy, cutting, and pasting. Uh, those are commands. And so you first have to go to command mode by hitting escape. Then I will just type P, and that pasted out. 
So again, um, if I want to copy this line, I would do YY to yank it, and then go down to where I want it, and then do P to paste. There's actually two different P's. So let's say I want to copy this uh, comment right here, and then go down to this line. I can either paste it before this line, or I can paste it below this line. If I want to do it above this line, it would be capital P, like that. And if I want to do it below the line, it would be lowercase p, like that. So Vim actually has two different paste um, commands. One is for paste before, which is capital P, and the other one is paste after, which is lowercase p. So that's how we do copying and pasting on an entire line at a time, with dd to cut it, um, or yy to copy it. And then you can paste it with either, either uppercase p or lowercase p. We can do this on a smaller, um, a smaller uh, set of things as well. For instance, I can copy a word with YW for yank word, and then I'll paste just that one word of input. Likewise, I can do DW to cut a word and then paste it somewhere else. So the cutting is done with D and the copying is done with Y. And then sort of what other thing you put alongside of it will determine how much you're copying or cutting. A whole line is by hitting the thing twice, so DD or YY. To do just a word, you do YW to copy or DW to cut. As you learn more movement com commands in Vim, you can combine those up with the co uh, copying and cutting commands. So. For instance, if I was here and I want to copy just to the end of the line, I can actually do Y dollar. That copies from wherever you are to the end of the line, because as we saw in a bit, dollar brings you to the end of the line. So every movement command can actually be combined up with Y to copy until you get to that place, or D to cut until you get up to the place. And that's why. Um, Vim becomes so powerful and so much more effective than other text editors because in other text editors, I don't think there's commands to copy from here to the end of the line. You would have to like drag and select that to do it or just copy the single word or copy three words from here or copy from here to the end of the file. And Vim has all of those commands built in because you can combine any movement up with any of these actions, um, copy or cut. For now, though, that's probably um, will take you a bit to get used to that idea. So probably for now, what I would say is remember that YY copies a line and DD cuts or deletes a line. And then you can use P to paste it wherever you actually want it to go. One important thing related to copying and pasting is that Vim doesn't use the same clipboard as your own computer. So if you go to a website and copy something with Control C, and then do P to paste into Vim, it's not going to work because your own computer keeps track of its own clipboard and Vim has its own copy and paste clipboard. As we'll see later on in the semester, Vim actually has multiple clipboards. Um, it lets you sort of like copy and paste things into different places, which is actually a really cool thing that Vim has that other text editors don't. But um, if you do want to paste something from a website into Vim, you will have to do it differently. So I'll paste something from the course notes from this. Um, I've pasted a sentence from the notes. And then to, rather, I've copied a sentence from the notes. And now if I want to paste it in, the way to do that is to go into insert mode in Vim and then paste it into your terminal. So it's not a Vim thing to paste in. It's rather focused on what terminal you're using. My Linux terminal, the paste command is Control shift v so that is how I would paste into this file. If you're using PuTTY, you would do right click. So pasting works a little bit differently depending on sort of what terminal you're actually using. Vim's sort of YY to yank and P to paste uses its sort of own Vim specific uh, clipboard for keeping track of those things. All right, let's look at searching next. Searching is really useful in programming because if you're working on a big program and you see a variable or a method that you want to sort of like go and see where else it's being used, searching for that thing is uh, a really useful thing to be able to do. In Vim, search is done with the slash command. And so like colon for w, uh, colon w, 
it brings you a thing down here. Slash does that as well. When you type slash, it will bring your cursor to the bottom of the screen so that you can see what you're searching for. And so if I type, um, let's say, name, it will highlight as I go N-A-M-E and show me what things are being matched as I'm typing it. Then when I hit enter, it will um, tell me what things match it. Um, I was at, my cursor was at the bottom of the screen, so it tells me that it had to continue at the top to go to the next reference of it. Then you can hit the N key, N standing for next, to jump between the places that it found that thing that you searched for in the file. If you want to go to the previous one, you can do capital N to go backwards through them, or you can do uh, lowercase n to go forwards through them. So let me open up a bigger file so that we can play around with search a little bit more. Okay, so I have um, here some bigger files. Here's a um, uh, Java code for this little command line game that I used to give as a project in a comp sci class. And so when I open this file, you can see it's quite a lot larger than the other little Python file that we had. It's 210 lines. Um, so we can practice our sort of searching commands and things like that in this file. So if I want to say check and see where this, um, let's say set status method is being called at, I can search for set status like that by typing slash followed by what I want to search for. In this case, it's set status and hit enter. Then I can use n to jump between them like this and see all of the places that this um, method is being called. I can then use capital N, like I said, to jump back between the other ones. If you want to, you can also begin by searching uh, backwards to start with. And to do that, you type the question mark instead of the slash. So slash is search forward. And question mark is search backwards. So if I type set uh, question mark uh, set status like this, then I'll move backwards through them by default. So either way you search, either slash or question mark will work. There's actually a sort of even easier way to search for something in Vim, which is to just use either the asterisk or the pound or hash sign on top of something. So if I'm on top of this set status method and I want to go between all the places that appears in the file, I can just type asterisk on top of it. And that automatically searches for the word that's under the cursor. And then I can use n to go between them just like as if I searched for it normally. So asterisk searches forward for something and the pound sign actually searches backwards for something. So either one of those you can use as well. So if I want to see everywhere this key variable is used, I can do the uh, asterisk key on it, and that will search for where this word key actually appears at. All right, like searching, um, replacing is something that Vim has as well. So if I want to instead, let's say, rename this key variable here, um, you can see there's a couple of places key is used in the file. Um, if I want to replace key everywhere that appears in the file, I can do that with a colon command. So I would do colon. Then the way that search and replace works in Vim is it's really powerful and it gives you lots of options. If you want to replace in the whole file, you do percent. There's other things we could put here that only does like a portion of the file. But for now, we can do colon percent and then S for substitute. Then you use slashes to separate the part of the text you want to replace and what you want to replace it with. So if I want to rename key to, let's say, um, button, I can do it like that, colon percent S slash key slash button. If I do that, it should replace everywhere that it said key with a button. And so now if you look, if I search for key, now it's going to say it's not found. Instead, it's renamed everything from key to button. Let me just undo that. Uh, so that's, that's how we can do this search and replace thing. Now there's a couple of things we can add to the end of this um, slash here. The most helpful one is C for confirm. 
what that does is it asks you every single time, do you want to replace it? And I can see, I can say either yes to replace it, or I can say no to replace it. So maybe in this comment, I want to leave it where it is, and then I'll say N for no, and then yes, yes. And it will ask you basically for every um, substitution that it's going to do if you want to really do it if you push this uh, C at the end of it here. The other one that's really useful, let me sort of make a new line in this file for this, is um, the G command. Uh, added on to our replace function. And so what that does is it controls whether it will do multiple replacements on the same line. I kind of wish this was the default, but uh, in Vim, if we have the word key in multiple places, like if I say in a comment something like replace one key with another key, if I do this substitution, but I don't put the dash G in there, it does all of them, except it only does one per line. So on, in this case, it replaced key with button, but it only did it once per line. So this key got replaced with button, but this one here didn't. It just stayed as saying the word key. Um, so if you, push, if you put a G at the end of the final slash in your substitute command, then it does all of them. And so now if I go up, it replaced both of these keys with buttons. So generally, I always put the G there just to make it so that if the text I want substituted appears multiple times on the same line, it will go ahead and do all of them. Uh, and then the C, like I said, is also really useful, especially if you're not completely sure if you want to do all the substitutions. Sometimes you can accidentally substitute something you didn't mean to. And so putting the, uh, the C on there as well is helpful for that. All right, next let's talk about Vim's visual mode. Visual mode is super duper helpful. It lets you select multiple bits of text and do things with it. It's probably the most helpful way to do copying and pasting and cutting and pasting. Like let's say for instance, I want to move this method uh, show help down below the method for set status. Probably the simplest way to do that is with a visual mode. So you'll go to the beginning of where you want to do the cut. Then you type V to go into visual mode. Then you'll move down to select all of the text you want. So I'm using the J key, J key to go down to select all of the text that I want. Make sure that I've got it all. And then I can type D. D stands for delete or cut, as we talked about before. And then now I've cut that method. Then I can go down to where I want it to appear um, next. And then I do P for paste. So that is a easy way to sort of cut and paste. Visual mode is an easy way to sort of select text and sort of move it around. So if I want to move these, for instance, down here, then I can do it like that. Using visual mode sort of allows you to more easily see what it is that you're going to be copying and pasting. If I want to copy just this word, I can select it in visual mode, then do Y to yank it, and then I'll be able to paste it wherever I feel like. So visual mode, uh, it, it, it's based on where you have the cursor at the beginning and the end of it. So let's say I want to copy this line and I went into visual mode and I want to select the whole thing. Well, as you can see, I messed up and I didn't get the beginning S. And so no matter what I do with this, I won't uh, easily be able to get the S at the beginning of the line. But Vim actually has a way around this. If you want to go back and adjust the other end of the selection, you can hit O and that will bring you to the other side. So then you can make sure the S is selected. Hit O again and you go back to the other side. So this O command in visual mode sort of lets you go from one side to the other as you're sort of making the selection until you're sure that you've got everything that you want. And then you can do either D or Y to copy or paste it. There's other things we can do with it as well. We can use other Vim commands, one of which is this greater than sign, which looks like an arrow to the right. And if you hit that, it will move the selection to the right. It will increase the indentation level. So now you can see this curly brace is lined up with the T. If I want it to increase the indentation of it, I can do the greater than sign, which as you can see, moved it so that now it is indented further over. 
You can do the same thing if you want to unindent something with the less than sign, which looks like an arrow to the left. That will move it one to the left, uh, as, as you can see. Um, doing that makes it go from here to here. If your indentation just gets all wonky, like let's say this is here, um, this is here, this is a little bit off, there's another command you can use with visual mode that will just fix the indentation to whatever it should be. At least this works in Java, which is based on curly braces. In Python, it might not necessarily be able to work because in Python, as you probably know, um, there's no curly braces or anything to tell them what the indentation is supposed to be. But if we select something like this in Java code and hit the equal sign, it will correct the indentation to what it thinks is the proper way for it to be indented. So if we wanted to re-indent the whole file, we can do a few things. We can type gg to go to the beginning. We can type v to go into visual mode. We can type g, capital G, to go to the end. Now the entire file is selected in visual mode. And now we can hit equals, which will re-indent everything properly uh, from the beginning of the file all the way to the end, which is a handy thing to be able to do. All right, next, um, I've actually been using these commands uh, as we've gone through the files because um, I, I, I want to fix some of the problems we've made by, by doing some of these example commands. But if you delete a line that uh, you want to have it back. Um, Vim, of course, has an undo command. Undo in Vim is just you. So just you does undo. You can mess up a lot of things with the file, deleting a whole bunch of lines. And then you can, just like any other text editor, hit the undo command multiple times to go back and undo all of the changes that you've made. There's also redo, which is uh, Control R. So um, Vim usually doesn't have key commands that have controls and shifts and alts in them. But this is an exception. The command to redo changes is control R. So you can use U to go back and control R to go forward. All right, so we covered a lot on Vim so far. We talked about how to get between the different modes of Vim, between the insert mode and the command mode. Then we looked at how to move around the file in multiple sort of ways, either with the arrow keys or the sort of more Vim advanced way of using HJKL, along with things like uh, caret and dollar sign, little gg and capital G to jump to the beginning of the end. We talked about how to do copying and cutting and pasting and saving and quitting, um, undo and redo, visual mode. We talked about how to search and how to replace. I think this brings Vim, once you've sort of learned these key commands, um, it brings Vim sort of on par with editors like uh, you know, Visual Studio Code or Sublime Text, or um, I'm not really sure which are the popular ones people are using, sort of the normal GUI interface editors where you sort of click around and it has a menu and stuff like that. Um, Vim has a lot more hidden under the surface that we haven't looked at yet. Some of the things we'll do that in week 13 when we get to talking more about Vim. Um, but even that doesn't cover all of the things that Vim can do. One of the nice things about Vim is you can improve upon it over many, many years of using it. I have been using Vim for close to 20 years now. And there's still things that I'll pick up from other Vim users or that I'll see online and that I'll incorporate into my own usage of it. Um, it's nice having a program that still has more to offer and you know you can continue to learn stuff about it that improves your workflow even after using it for so long. So um, what I'd recommend is sort of make a little cheat sheet, make a little sticky note or something with the Vim commands that you will use and need to uh, remember most often. I would start with like copy and cut and paste so that as you're working on Vim, especially if you're taking a class where your primary editor is Vim, like CompSci 305 or 350 or something like that, um, so that you get in the habit of using sort of the basic stuff that we've talked about today. Then you can sort of go past that and uh, learn more about Vim. Uh, there's a few ways to do that. One is there's this command Vim Tutor. I guess, let me show you that real quick. Um, the Vim tutor command is really cool. If you type Vim tutor like that, it will bring up this sort of online tutorial for you, basically, where it in the terminal has this little help task at text, and it gives you lessons sort of as you go. It talks about HJKL to begin with, um, and then it goes down and it talks about 
some of the things that we've talked about and some more things that we haven't talked about really. You, this is inside of Vim, so if you want to get out of Vim Tutor, it's just colon Q and it will quit you back out of it again. So um, that's one way you can get better at Vim is using the Vim Tutor command. The other way is just practice using it and uh, every now and then go back and sort of see if there's other sort of ways that you can improve. One other cool thing about Vim is that other programs have Vim modes. So sometimes uh, you will find it more convenient to use like an IDE program like IntelliJ or Eclipse. But every big IDE also has a Vim mode so that when you're using the IDE, you can still use the commands that we've talked about today. Um, you can make it so your IDE has a command mode and you can hit escape to go into it and you can use the JK to go down and the slash key to search and so on like that. Um, so Vim is such a widely used and beloved program that people have sort of like made ways that you can use it even if you are using an IDE in the end. Um, there's sort of differences of opinions on uh, how much, uh, how worth it it is to use Vim and how worth it it is to put in the effort to get better at it. I'm firmly in the camp that believes that if you're a software developer or a cybersecurity expert or a system administrator or anything like that, your job is so much spent on using text files, working with text, editing text, adding text. And I think spending a little time learning how to use a really advanced tool for dealing with text pays off hundredfold down the line. Um, so my advice is to uh, use Vim in your classes and uh, take the time to get good at it because it really, really does pay off. So that's this week. Like I said, this was focused on giving you the basics of Vim. In week 13, we'll talk more about Vim and cover some of the things Vim does that other text editors just don't do. But that's week 13. Next week, we will be talking about the Git system for managing the source code for a project, uh, managing revisions, and uh, uh, keeping track of your progress and stuff like that. So that's what the next week will be. I hope you all um, have a good week. Talk to you later.